so let's let's pivot now and kind of talk about um, the current state of obesity, which um, uh, is 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 really seeing a success it's it's never seen, um, and it's been a relatively short period of time. I think three years ago, very few people knew what semaglutide was, um, or even Ozempic, which is the trade name given to the diabetes version of that drug. Whereas today, I, I, I can't imagine too many people haven't heard the words Ozempic um, or some of its derivatives, but I think Ozempic might be one of the most recognized um, of these drugs. So again, it's pretty remarkable. Um, mm -hmm. It's also worth noting that these are not new drugs, right? I mean, semaglutide and trisepatide are newer drugs, but they've been around for a while, at least semaglutide has. And liraglutide. Liraglutide and others have been around for a decade, you know, at, at least a decade. Um, and they've successfully treated people with type 2 diabetes. And like all things, or as is often the case, you sort of notice something in treating one subset of patients that mm -hmm. gives you an insight into treating another. And so basically, as people with type 2 diabetes were treated with this class of drug, you notice that it wasn't just improving their diabetes, they were also losing weight. And that led to what became a set of dedicated experiments to test the efficacy of these drugs in non-diabetic obese patients, and the rest is history. Talk a little bit about what you what you think is socially and psychologically happening at the moment. It, wh why? Why are people so interested in this drug? Yeah, I think it's it's fascinating. I think people are interested for the obvious reason. And the obvious reason is lots of people want to lose weight and lots of people want to help other people lose weight. And for the first time in, in history, um, as you've noted, we have drugs that are now powerfully effective and appear to be reasonably safe. We've had drugs that were powerfully effective before, but would kill you. And we've had drugs that were reasonably safe before, but at best, modestly efficacious. We now have ones that are powerfully effective and appear safe, reasonably safe. Safety is a social judgment, right? Not a factual determination. Risk is a factual determination. Safety is a social judgment. And so it invites all kinds of interesting speculations. Um, about cause. What is the role of GLP-1 in causing obesity? And is there a role? Just because it, things involving GLP-1 treat it doesn't mean it's involving the cause. Um, what's the um, effect on stigma? If we can treat it, does that reduce stigma in the same way that Viagra changed many things around erectile dysfunction? Uh, and interestingly, you know, I sort of didn't predict the full cultural impact of that, which shows you it's hard to predict these things. People didn't predict what VAG was for. It was being used for something else. They noticed erections as a side effect, and then they started working on it. And in the early 90s, when I went and visited one of my buddies who's a biostatistician at Pfizer, and that individual told me they were working on this new thing and explained what it was to me, I laughed at it and I said, what are you wasting your time on something so ridiculous and unimportant? Why don't you do some important research? Shows you what I know. Um, so I think here we're, we're learning that, again, that we get surprised in science. We're seeing a moral panic. This is subjective on my part, but this is something I'm noticing. A lot of old arguments that had kind of gone semi-dormant, at least in the academic community, um, over the years of, well, if you give people a drug for obesity, doesn't teach them anything. And therefore, when you stop the drug, the weight just comes back. And this was said as a criticism, as opposed to saying, well, who said it had to teach them anything? Who said that was the goal? And for many drugs, anti-seizure medications, if you have seizures, antihypertensives, anti-diabetes drugs, um, et cetera, you're going to take those for the rest of your life if you're in the right class for that. We don't say, but the person with schizophrenia shouldn't get the drug because if we stop giving it to them, the schizophrenia symptoms come back. I say, no, schizophrenia is a serious disease. We need to give it to them. With obesity, this has come up again. 
it sort of seemed to be put down a few that idea a few years back. And now I'm seeing I'm hearing it again, this kind of moralistic judgment about that. We're also hearing the moralistic judgments come about motivation. It's okay if you're motivated for health. It's not okay to get the drug if you're motivated for something other than health. Which implies that assuming we have the same health issues, I mean, the person would equally benefit from their health. We make a moral judgment about your motivation, but there is no evidence that I know of that people who are motivated for health to lose weight do better than people who are motivated for cosmetic or any ego, business, any other reasons. So I think we need to get over some of that moral panic. Once we get past the safety, the cost, and the availability issues, and I don't want to trivialize those, the safety, the cost, and the availability issues are big issues. The safety issue is really, and in that sense, I'm defining safety in the sense that sometimes the FDA defines it, which is safety involves risk and risk involves uncertainty as opposed to being risk involving known factor, right? No, I don't just mean the probability that you get this. I mean the fact that we don't know what happens if you take it for 40 years. Um, so there is some safety issue, some open questions. No one's taken it for 40 years, so we don't know what happens if you take it for 40 years. Right now, it's very expensive. Our country is divided on how healthcare should be paid for. There's a lot of different opinions. Um, and also, there's an availability problem. But let's just fast forward to a time when we say we've we've learned the safety. And by the way, say, say a little bit more about the availability problem. I mean, uh, I only realize it because you see compounding pharmacies now making semaglutide and terzepatide, which when I first saw that, I couldn't understand how they were doing that legally because uh, that's that's pretty clearly not within the statute of what a compounding pharmacy can do. A compounding pharmacy can't make an existing FDA approved drug. They have to make a variation of that drug. For example, they have to change the delivery mechanism if they make something topical that would only be available orally or something of that nature. Unless, and one of the exceptions to the rule is if the FDA approved drug can't be uh, produced in sufficient quantities, then a compounding pharmacy can create the exact same drug that is available through the FDA label. So presumably that is happening. Do we have a sense of why it's happening? Uh, what is the manufacturing bottleneck? Obviously demand is outstripping supply, but that the, the, the question is why is supply not able to meet demand? And then secondly, do you have any insight into whether the quality control at the compounding pharmacy level, it matches that of Lili or uh, Nova Nordisk? So with respect to the first part, why is there an availability problem? I don't know the technical mechanics of it, but my understanding is that the technical process by which these drugs are produced is different than some other drugs, and the technical process is a slow one. Mm. And so until they ramp up more and more production sites, they just can't do it fast enough. But they are ramping up more and more production sites, um, so that's good. Um, Novo just bought, bought Catalan, which happens to have a plant in, in my backyard in Bloomington, Indiana. So we'll probably see more of that ramping up. Um, we, uh, the second thing is about the compounding pharmacies. So when I first heard about it, I'm, I'm far from an expert in compounding pharmacies or the legal aspects, but I too was skeptical. Is this okay? Was the quality control and you know, is this a kind of shady thing? And I started to hear a lot of reports about this and described as though it was a very shady endeavor. And again, that moralizing came in again. Then I've talked to some other people who are experts in it uh, and who are using these. And I've said, now admittedly, again, this is their business, so they have a motivation. But they have said, well, when we do it, and they've described, and I said, tell me your process. Who do you use? How do you do it? What quality control? And then they've gone through Say for this compounding pharmacy that I use, we use it in this way, this degree of quality control. And I say, wow, that sounds to me, again, I, I, have, I have not physically inspected the plants, I'm not an expert in it, but it sounds to me like some very rigorous quality control. So I don't think we should be dismissive of the concerns around compounding pharmacies, but I also don't think we want to paint everybody with the same brush 
the question becomes, as with anything, is show me your data, show me your evidence on your quality control, your procedures, and if they're good, they're good, and let's use them. Let's get over the moral panic. Thank you.